Well, you can have a seat. And good morning. My name is Jacob Smith, and I am our college pastor here at our Anderson campus. And I mean, it's just, it's always an honor. It's always a joy, a privilege for me to be here with you guys. Um, if you're new this summer, let me welcome you. Hopefully you've already received a few welcomes already, but, but man, we are so glad you are here. We're so glad that you're joining us kind of in this different sort of season, this, this summer season where a lot of students are gone, where restaurants are open, streets are empty, right? And, and when a lot of different people come up on this stage, that's another part of the summer, is, is that a lot of different uh, wonderfully gifted communicators and teachers will be, will be kind of coming through our different auditoriums across our different campuses. And, but, but all of us are united, maybe not in, in who we are, but we're ident- united in the, the theme, the topics that we're preaching through. We're, we're essentially looking at the lives of, of biblical figures and the legacies that they leave behind. Men and women who, who, for better or worse, maybe followed the Lord or didn't. Who, who lived lives that maybe we want to emulate or, or lives we want to desperately avoid. And, and for this morning, as we kind of set these things up, as we kind of move into this series as we look at the life of a man named Abimelech. What I need us to recognize at the very beginning is that, is that we all are people who will seek to establish our own kingdoms on this earth. Every single one of us on some level are seeking to establish kind of our own little kingdom. Some of us are more obvious uh, than others. Right? That, that should be our national motto. If you're in the bathroom, just get out. Right? That's... That's maybe one way to establish a kingdom here on earth. Maybe some of us are inspired by this. Please keep me updated uh, as you progress. But, but for others of us, maybe it's a little bit more subtle. Maybe it looks a little bit different. For some of us, maybe it's the safety and security we want for ourselves or for our family. I know that's where I land a lot of times. When I think about, I mean, the resources that I have, the, the plans that I'm making, the budget that I follow, a lot of it is centered on, well, I want to be safe and secure, Right? I want to have stability in my life. I want to provide this, not just for myself, but, but sacrificially for my wife, for my children. A lot of us, I mean, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for maybe that salary, that, that, that number on the pay stub. We're looking for those, maybe those grades, if we're still in, in academia, if we're maybe needing to buy those certain things, right? We want certain particular stuff. We want a particular type of child. We want a certain t- particular type of family, a particular lifestyle. We have these ideas and these expectations and these goals that we set for ourselves. And in doing so, what we're doing is we're kind of, we're creating this little kingdom, we're creating this little, these walls around these ideas and these expectations that we think, well, and if I can just get all of these pieces together, if my house can look like this, if my kids can look like that, if I have this many dogs and I go on this kind of vacation, if I have all these pieces together, then I'm going to be okay. I mean, it, it, it's good to value safety, right, and security. We're called to be stewards with what God has given us, to be responsible, productive members of society. Absolutely. But the problem is that we can become, I can become so focused on achieving those goals, so focused on, on these kind of secondary objectives in life that I completely miss out on the truth that God has promised to provide what we need. That as his children, he says he is our good father who's going to give us what we need. He's going to provide our daily bread. And that provision doesn't always look exactly like what we expect. That provision doesn't always match the blueprints that we draw up for our kingdom. But he says, you can trust me. You can trust that I'm good. And yet we find ourselves dedicating our lives to chasing after personal satisfaction and chasing after these little kingdoms when God has given us a better purpose. When he's calling us not to pursue our own desires, not to pursue our own plans and expectations, not to build our own kingdoms, but instead to pursue his kingdom first and his righteousness And as we walk in that life, as we pursue his path, he says, man, that's where the ultimate satisfaction and joy is found, greater than any other plan you could create for yourself. See, this morning we're looking at the life of a man named Abimelech to better understand the foolishness of dedicating ourselves to building our own safe and secure little kingdoms in this world rather than trusting God's provision and his purpose for our lives. When we look in the book of Judges, in chapter 9, we we see the beginning of the tale of Abimelech. Judges chapter 9 opens up verse 1 talking about Abimelech, the son of Jerubbaal. Right now, Jerubbaal is not a name that a lot of us recognize, 
But this is actually a, a secondary name, another way of describing, another way of, of naming a, a man named Gideon, who we've, you've either heard from this stage already this summer or will soon. But, but Gideon was a wonderful judge in the nation of Israel. He, he led them out of captivity or against these enemies that were really evil and kind of oppressive. Uh, but Gideon had some issues towards the end of his life. He became very self-focused, very self-motivated, uh, kind of fell away from the calling of the Lord on his life. And, and we see that play out in his children. So when we see Abimelech, the son of Jerubbaal, the son of Gideon, he went to Shechem to see his mother's relatives. And he said to them and to his mother's entire extended family, he says, hey, tell all all the leaders of Shechem this. Why would you want to have 70 men, all Jerubbaal's sons, ruling over you when you can have just one ruler? Recall, I am your flesh and blood. You see, what Abimelech is doing is he is setting up this kind of me or them, this us versus them mentality in the people of Shechem. He's saying, hey, this Gideon guy, this Jerubbaal, this previous judge over Israel, Towards the end of his life, he fell, he, he fell away from the call of the Lord. And so he took for himself all these wives, all these concubines. And he had all these kids. He had 70 sons through his wives. But Abimelech was actually this kind of orphaned little, he, he was the son of, a, of a, basically a prostitute that, that Gideon had kind of taken in. And so he's been neglected and kind of pushed to the side all of his life. And so when he kind of reaches this age, he goes to Shechem, the, the people, the, remember the, the family of his mother, he says, hey, do you really want to be ruled by all these kind of guys that don't even know you? There's 70 of them. How could that ever work well? He says, wouldn't you rather just be ruled by me, your flesh and blood? Right? He's like, I, I get you. I'm one of you. I'm a man of the people, right? I'm a, I'm a blue collar Shechemite just like you. And he says, you should trust me. He says, don't you want me to be your ruler instead of these other guys? And I'll tell you, this is the setup for, for maybe a, a wonderful story, right? This is kind of a, a familiar setup to that kind of unlikely hero kind of story, right? He's the son, son of the concubine, neglected by his brothers, but he's finding this moment where maybe, maybe this is his time to rule. And so when the people hear this, they, they, they speak on his behalf to all the leaders of Shechem. And they reported his proposal. And the leaders, they were drawn to Abimelech. And they said, yeah, he is our close relative, right? They're like, yeah, maybe he does get us. He understands what it's like. He, he understands us on another level that those other, those other kind of, you know, ivory tower, 70 sons, they, they just don't get us the same way. And so they paid him 70 silver shekels out of the temple of Baal Barith. And Abimelech then used the silver to hire some lawless, dangerous men as his followers. So Abimelech, he goes to the people, he drums up support, they pay him this money, they take it out of this temple of Baal, this, this temple that was erected to a false god, right? Not to Yahweh, not to the living God, but to this false idol. But he takes the money and he uses it to hire these lawless, dangerous men. Literally in the Hebrew, it's this term empty. They're empty meaning worthless, meaning they, they have no good, there, there's no virtue in them, right? There's no, they're not upstanding citizens. Like, it's not like he goes and finds, like, the, the city council, and they're like, let's go, Abimelech. Like, these are, like, bad dudes. But these are the men that Abimelech gathers around himself. And we're like, oh, right, this is starting to take a little bit of a turn. We thought maybe it would be an unlikely hero, kind of a feel-good underdog story, but, you know, I don't know, there's a little bit of, there's some, false idol money and some dangerous men. Okay, but hey, you know, maybe, maybe he'll reform them, right? Like maybe they'll come around and be like, wow, wow, Abimelech, Yahweh is the way. Wow, so cool. You know, but maybe. <laughs> but then he went to his father's home in Ophrah and he murdered his half-brothers. Uh, well, okay, well. <laughs> the 70 legitimate sons of Jerubbaal, he murdered all of them on one stone. Literally what, what's being described here is he, he, he trots them. It's not that he goes and like finds them in the night and he kills them one by one. He, he rounds them up and in front of the entire gathering, in front of all the people in one stone, in other words, in this kind of symbolic moment, he trots them out one after another, after another, after another, and he kills every single one of them. 70 brothers. How indeed. So things have taken a turn, right? 
Abimelech is maybe not that underdog that we were hoping for. But even in the midst of that, even in this kind of grisly, just uh, ter- terrible moment, the leaders of Shechem and Beth and Milo, they're like, yeah, okay, game on, right? They assembled, they went and they made Abimelech king by the oak near the pillar in Shechem. They go to this, this special oak where, the, where kind of kingship, where, where authority was given. And they say, hey, you're going to be our new king. You're our new leader. Thank you for getting rid of those, you know, those no good 70 sons that we didn't want those guys. We want you, Abimelech. We want you to rule us. You've proven yourself to be a man who gets things done. Abimelech, who was willing to do anything to take the power that he wanted. Right, that, that, there's drive and determination seen right there, right? It's, it's something that, that maybe in, in certain contexts we admire about someone, that, that drive, that determination, that singular focus, right? That's, that, that's what it takes to be successful in this world. This is a lot of times what we talk about. There's books written about how you need to be driven. You need to be dedicated, right? You sleep only these many hours because you got to give the rest of this to, to this pursuit or that pursuit, to this career path, to that job opportunity. And, and we use this singular focus. We use, we use this determination and this drive, and we have to make sacrifices, right? That's what we see in Abimelech. It was this willingness to sacrifice anything and anyone to reach this ultimate goal that he had. And it's something that we see in people even to this day, right? In the late 1800s, uh, there was a man that, that a lot of us know the name of Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie uh, created this steel empire, right? He, he created this incredible uh, business where he had his hands, just an incredible, incredibly uh, sharp businessman who, who set up this, this financial empire centered around the manufacture and selling of steel. And he had, though, a business partner. He had a man named Henry Clay Frick, who was right there alongside of him for most of the way. He was the chairman of Carnegie Steel. And his nickname given to him by many publications in America at that time, 1892, was the most hated man in America. Wow. Impressive, right? Like, that's pretty... That's pretty good. Like, that's the most anything is pretty impressive. He was the most hated man in America. Henry Clay Frick, look at that guy. That puffy beard and the sweet little tie. Like, he doesn't look... That terrible, but the reality is that, man, as he was serving as the chairman of Carnegie Steel, he proved himself to be incredibly vicious. You see, in 1892, the world was kind of figuring out uh, that steel was awesome, right? They realized that everything was just better when it was made out of steel. Ships, buildings, right? Backpacks, like whatever. Like they wanted to make everything out of steel. They're like, we, we got to steal it. It's got to be steelified. And so because of that, Carnegie and, and, and Frick have created this, em, this steel empire, and they're suddenly selling it like gangbusters, man. They're just selling all this steel, and prices are going way, way, way up, and they're profiting just like crazy. Their, their profits are through the roof. And so in the midst of this just economic boom, the workers and the plants and the facilities where they were producing the steel, they had their contract, they had, they had unionized, and their union's contract had come up. It had ended. It was time to renew the contract. 1892, things are booming. They're like, man, this is our time. What a perfect time for us to renegotiate our contract. And so they went to to Henry Clay Frick, the workers at the plant that he specifically oversaw, and they came and asked him for a raise, a reasonable raise. Like, hey, we we think we deserve about 15% more than, than what we're making now, right? Because of, man, there's these profits, the work, it's it's just it's unbelievable. So Henry Clay Frick looks across the desk at the union leaders and he counteroffers. 22% 22% pay cut, which they're like, well, no, that doesn't make any sense. And so they reject the deal, at which, at which point Henry Clay Frick says, okay, uh, then you're not welcome here anymore. And so his counter-counter offer was he locked out all of the workers. Uh, he built uh, sniper towers around the plant so that they couldn't get men with guns, like actual snipers were in these towers. And he installed cannons around the plant that would fire a boiling liquid on any worker who tried to approach. Right? So he's turned straight up into like a Marvel villain. Like he is <laughs> full on 
superhero, bat, like supervillain. And, and he's, as he's hiring these kind of scabs, he's hiring in these temporary workers, the, the, the regular workers are very upset. Like they're on strike. They're like, this, you can't do this. Somehow they get their own cannon. I don't know. Cannons were just all over the, I guess it was all the steel, but they, they showed up and they had this huge standoff and, and it just, it wasn't being resolved. It went on for weeks. People were dying in the midst of this incredible standoff until one guy a few weeks into it said, you know what? The real problem here is Frick, right? It's, it's that Henry Clay Frick guy. And so what he did is he snuck into the plant and he made his way into Henry Clay Frick's office and he found him sitting at his desk. He burst in the office, Henry Clay Frick. He's sitting at his desk. The man pulls out a gun and he shoots him twice in the neck, okay? Two bullets in his neck. At which point, Henry Clay Frick, no joke, stands up, went across the room, wrestled the man to the ground, and sat on him until the police showed up with two two bullets in his neck, right? And maybe they got slowed down a little bit by the beard, but like not that much, right? Like not enough that you would think he'd be okay. But just leaning into his super villainy, he tackles the guy down, takes him down. He's back to work within a week. Within a week, he's back at work. And by back to work, what I mean is he shows up day one, he fires 2,500 workers, and he gives everyone else that's still around a 50% pay cut. Henry Clay Frick, most hated man in America. Now we're like, okay, yeah, no, I get that. Yeah, (laughs) that lines up. That dedication and that drive, that perseverance, man, I'll tell you, if it is misguided, if it's going the wrong direction, that misguided determination and devotion, it leaves massive destruction in its wake. Massive destruction. In our lives, what are we willing to sacrifice for those personal goals? What are we willing to sacrifice for that that paycheck? Or or for that organization we want to lead, for that promotion we want to obtain? What what are we willing to sacrifice for that that image we want to present to the world around us? That lifestyle we want to maintain? What are we willing to sacrifice for that relationship that we just, we want to make work? What what do we want to sacrifice for that, that status we want to have and carry with us everywhere we go? What are the things and who are the people that get cut along the way? For the sake of that singular focused goal, do you see people as an obstacle between you and the place you want to be, or do you see the people around you as an opportunity to demonstrate the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy that God has shown us? You know, our country has been talking a lot lately about immigrant families, and there's a lot of nuance to that that I recognize, but I would challenge us, man, regardless of our political alignments, regardless of our political feelings, when we see someone in desperate need, where's our heart? Where's our heart? When we see someone in just a horrific spot, do we see them as just another obstacle to our end goal of, of that security or that stability or those resources that we want to use in a certain way? Or do we see these people as an opportunity to share the love and the grace, the mercy of God? The Lord is calling us to live a life that's different. He's asking us to point our determination in his direction. But Abimelech missed that, right? He missed that. He murders all of his brothers. He's so determined. He's so set on this goal. And yet the tragedy of Abimelech is where does it even get him? We look a few, a little bit later in the chapter. We look a little bit later in his life. And this is about three years after the fact. We see that the leaders of Shechem, they rebelled against Abimelech. And they put bandits in the hills who were robbing, who robbed everyone who traveled by on the road. But Abimelech, he found out about it, right? Suddenly, oh, turns out those people who are disloyal to the sons of Gideon, oh, they're also going to be disloyal to Abimelech. And so they begin to rebel against him. They kind of have this like secret, like, oh, we'll, we'll kind of bleed them dry. We'll, we'll set up these robbers and they're going to feed us the money that they get. Abimelech finds out about it. And so he shows up to Shechem and he fought against the city all that day. And he captures the city and he killed all the people in it. 
And then he leveled the city and he spread salt over it. In other words, when Abimelech sees the, these men, these women, when he sees these people rebel against him, right, proving their disloyalty, that was just inherent to who they were, he murders everyone and he burns everything. He salts the earth in this symbolic gesture of saying nothing is going to grow here ever again, right? This is generally not, not what you look for in a leader, right? That's generally not what you want in the person who's, who's leading you, who's in charge of you. And yet he was willing to do anything to reach that position, right? We saw that. We saw that determination where he was willing to sacrifice anything and anyone who got in his way. And then once he got there, he wasn't, even, he wasn't even doing that great of a job. And yet he was, just as he was willing to sacrifice anything to get the, there, he was willing to sacrifice anything to hold on to it. Right? He held on to that position. He held on to that goal, onto that authority with such a closed, clenched fist at no matter what it might cost him. And he was blinded, right? He was blinded by this misguided focus. It distorted his view of the world. It, has, it distorted his view of people. These are the people that he's supposed to be leading and, and, and moving forward. These are the people, I mean, if, if you're a leader and you have no followers, you're not a leader. And yet he's murdering the people that are supposed to be following him. Why? Because he says, no, I, I don't want my authority to be threatened. I'm so focused on holding on to this at all costs. It has completely distorted my view of the world. And he's making tragic mistakes, huge mistakes because of this distorted Focus. What is happening? We can become so focused on this original idea. Y E S is yes. That is so true. And yet, if we get if we latch onto too hard, if we hold on to it too tight, right? It distorts our view. We make mistakes. E yes, right? It happens. Abimelech was willing to hold on so tightly. He wanted to close his fist around that authority so badly that, man, he just started making incredible mistakes. We can become so fixated on one thing, it distorts our view of everything and everyone around us. The, we are currently in, as a church, as a body, we are currently in this, this every knee season as, as a church, as an organization, as, as a body. What we're doing is we're, we're moving forward in faith, saying, God, we, we want to be used by you to plant more churches. We want to reach more people. That's what every need is about. We want to reach every neighbor and every nation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to see the world come to know him. We want to see the world erupt into worship over the God who saved us. That's what every knee is for. And I'll tell you, as we were leading up to this season, as we were reaching this point as a church, my wife and I were having conversations about, I mean, what does that mean for us? Like, what are we going to give? How, how can we surrender ourselves? How do we surrender our financial uh, abilities, our, 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 our holdings? How do we give of ourselves and our time and, our, and these different resources? And, and so we, we talked as a couple and we prayed about it and we, we reached these points where we're like, hey, we're going to give this amount. We're going to set this aside. We're going to go basically above and beyond uh, anything we've been giving. And we're going to give from these stored resources that we have. And it was something that just in the moment, in the process, we're like, yeah, this is awesome. This is great. And at about that same time, towards the end of the spring, uh, we as a college ministry, we were sending, preparing to send uh, dozens and dozens, dozens, about 50, 60 students overseas this summer. They're, they're all overseas basically right now uh, in different places sharing the gospel. And, and when we do that, as that happens, as the college pastor here at this campus, I get a lot of asks. I get a lot of support letters from students because I tell them to send them to me. I, 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 I invite it. I say, hey, you should ask me. You should send me a letter. Uh, help me, let me partner with you in that ministry financially. And man, I'll tell you, my wife and I, we kind of have this policy where, where we get the asks and, and we say yes. Man, that's, that's who we want to be. We want to be people who just say yes. And, and so we're supporting these different uh, students going overseas. We're supporting different fellows. We're supporting other people in other programs at other churches and in other places with other sending organizations. We were supporting Grace. And, and again, it wasn't really something that I was thinking too intently about until about a week or two into summer when suddenly I was finding myself just anxious. And, and I, would, I would wake up in, in the middle of the night and, and I, I, just, I, I had to like get up or I had to like start reading a book or something. I had to distract my thoughts because otherwise I would just lay there and I would just, I would just be anxious. And there, it wasn't a specific thing. It wasn't like this one particular issue. It was just sort of this general feeling of anxiety and, and uncertainty and, 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 and this fear that was captivating my thoughts and my attitude and my heart. 
And we got about a week into this and, and I, I just, I was struggling with it. I was like, man, I don't, I don't know really what's going on. I don't know why I'm suddenly feeling so, 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 so crippled and, and unsure. But, but what it really boiled down to is I was, as I was thinking about it and praying about it, is I realized, man, it's, it's this financial move. It's, it's this, this use of resources in a way that, that we haven't before. It was this, this faith-stretching giving that we were participating in. It was crippling me. Why? Because suddenly I realized as we were extending our hand to give in these different ways that my fist was a lot more closed than I thought it was. I'd gotten really comfortable in giving a certain amount to certain people. And I thought that that was good. I, I, I would have told you if you'd asked me three months ago, hey, do y'all live generously? I would say, yeah, absolutely. It's great. God blesses it and we love it. And, and I would be 100% confident in it. But I, I realized as that generosity was, was being stretched and grown that, oh, actually my generosity only goes so far. I actually still have a limit. There's a line that I still drew for those resources. And as it was starting to be pressed on, as we were starting to step over that line, as God was trying to, starting to pry my hands open, me and I was gripped by fear. And that was a hard realization to come to. It was a, it was a harsh wake-up call about the, the status of my heart, where my soul really was. And I looked at our life and I said, man, I, I can't continue to live like this. I, I need to adopt this, in, this mentality of, of surrender. I need to trust that God's going to be good, that he's going to provide. I need to trust that God's going to give us what we need. And within the, the boundaries of being wise and responsible, absolutely, we didn't just sell all of our possessions and just give it away and say, oh, please feed our children. Like we, we, we wanted to be, still be responsible stewards with a budget and, and we live responsibly. But man, there was this moment where I realized, man, I, I have to be willing to surrender my ideas, my preconceived notions and expectations about what stability and, and safety look like for me. I have to be willing to hold that in an open hand, to hold it up to the Lord. And for a lot of us, man, maybe we don't even realize what we're holding in a closed fist until it starts to slip away. And that's when we clamp down. That's when it's suddenly brought to our attention. For some of us, we know exactly what it is. And we've been wrestling with it all week. But I would challenge all of us to, to take a moment of self-reflection today, this evening, and ask ourselves, I mean, what is it that I'm holding on to above all else, right? Is it an ability that I have or a resource I, I've, I've amassed for myself? Is it a relationship that I'm maintaining? Is it a, a plan for my future? Uh, is, it, is it something, right? W what is something that you just can't possibly imagine losing? What, what could you just not possibly imagine going into tomorrow without having? Because the reality is that, man, these things are just that. They're things, and they're temporary. They're finite, they're fleeting. That's what we see in the life of Abimelech. It's that all that determination, all that drive, to, to all the sacrifices he made to get to that point, all the sacrifices he made to hold on to it at all costs. He obliterates the city of Shechem, he salts the earth, and he moved on to Thebes. Another city where there were people that were rebelling against him, that were pushing back on his rule. And so when he approached the entrance of the tower, this kind of central uh, stronghold in Thebes, uh, he was going to set it on fire, right? He was like, the fire worked really well in Shechem. He's like, I'm the fire guy now. This is just what I do. And as he got close to the tower, a woman threw an upper millstone down on his head and shattered his skull. Not a good thing, right? Like bullets in a neck. This is generally something that takes you out. And so he quickly called to the young man who carried his weapons. He said, draw your sword, kill me, so that they will not say a woman killed him. Abimelech is thinking ahead, right? He's a planner. <laughs> We've already seen that in his life. 
It's true to the last breath. He says, hey, this is what you got to do. He says, okay, my skull's been fractured. I'm dying. He knows he's dying. He's like, but the legacy I got to leave. He's like, I got to leave a better legacy. Don't let him say that a woman just threw a rock and knocked him and killed him. He's like, I don't want that to be my death. Instead, I want my death to be, he died by the sword. He lived by the sword. He died by the sword. Set the sword on fire first, then stab me, right? He's like, that's what I want. (laughs) And this is what's beautiful about the legacy of Abimelech. It's the only other time we ever see him mentioned in scripture. It's in 2 Samuel, when Jonathan, the, the son of the king of Israel at that time, was talking to some of his men. They were in this uh, military campaign, and he's lecturing some of his men who had made a mistake on the battlefield. And he's telling them that they got too close to a tower. And as he's lecturing them, he says, who struck down Abimelech, the son of Jerubbisheth? Didn't a woman throw an upper millstone down on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why'd you go so close to the wall? Literally, the only other time we see Abimelech mentioned, his entire legacy that he leaves behind is he becomes the poster child for don't get too close to the wall. Like, that's who he is. <laughs> he becomes the guy that's like, don't get Abimelech. So like, that's his thing. That's who he is. That's what his name carries with it through the centuries. That's the legacy they left behind. All that drive, all the determination, all that work, all that sacrifice, all those things, all that safety, all that security, all that kingdom that he amassed for himself, all of these things that he had gathered, those comforts and that power, that authority, that's what was left. That's what his name carried forward. A foolish mistake he made at the very end of his life where he died a disgraceful death. That's what he left behind. All that work, all that effort, all that drive, all that determination, nothing. It's for nothing. Something we have to recognize about our world is that it's fleeting, is that it's temporary. And some of us are more aware of that than others, right? We've, we've seen this in maybe the jobs that we've had that have suddenly gone away. We've seen this in the relationships that we were counting on that suddenly evaporated. The person left or the, the, there was sickness or whatever. Man, suddenly that, that organization we were, we were putting our time and energy into, it, it disbanded. That, that team that we put all of our hope in, it, it, it was gone. It, it fractured. Someone betrayed us. Someone failed us. We find ourselves recognizing that, man, this world, it simply doesn't last. Just yesterday, I helped bury my final grandparent. My mom's mom, last grandparent I had, passed away. We buried her yesterday. And I'll tell you, there's moments like that when you're standing at a graveside, looking at this casket, about to get lowered down, that you just think, Man, this world just doesn't last. It's not worth my life's dedication. It's not worth my life's work to try to establish some kingdom, some comfort, some security here on this earth. A life dedicated to pursuing our own kingdoms, it's wasted potential. Which is why it's so beautiful that as believers, God's created a better way that he's provided a higher purpose, that he says, you can seek after my kingdom first. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live that life we couldn't live, to die that death that we deserved so that we could enter into this new life, a new existence, a world beyond this world, an existence beyond this broken, messed up, faulty, temporary thing we call earth. God says, I have something better for you. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, we can trust that God's our father, that he's gonna provide us the needs that we have. And in light of that, because we no longer have to dedicate our, our, our full attention to that pursuit, we can pursue the things that are worth pursuing. We can pursue the kingdom that he wants to build the mission that he wants us to fulfill. Jesus looked at his disciples in Matthew 6. He told you, man, you don't need to worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for the unconverted pursue these things. And your heavenly father, he knows that you need them. But above all these other things, above all these other desires, above all these other pursuits, you should pursue his kingdom. You should pursue his righteousness. And all these other things, they'll be given to you. They'll be counted to you as well. He says, you have been freed up 
You don't have to have the same worries that you used to have. You don't have to have the same concerns that you used to have. He says, suddenly you can live a life that's different. You can live a life that's, that's distinct, where people look at you and they see a joy and they see a peace and they, says, they see a satisfaction that's created in your life through the work of the Holy Spirit because you have dedicated yourself to living in His will, in His plan, in His pursuit. Suddenly we can have lives that by their very nature are witnesses to the world around us where they see something different in the way we spend our time, in the way we spend our money, in the way we spend our resources, in the way that we live with our family, in the way that we interact with them. Suddenly our lives can be a testament to the God who saved us, to the God who, who will provide for us, to the God who's given us these incredible promises. To the God who says, I don't want you to waste your life gathering satisfaction for yourself that's just going to go away, that you can't even take with you. He says, pursue my kingdom, fulfill my purpose, to teach others what you've been taught, to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to take the name of Jesus Christ, that name above all names, that name that holds all power and all authority, that name that eventually is gonna bring every knee to the ground, is gonna bring every tongue to confess that he's Lord. He says, that's your purpose, that's your life. That's the kingdom that you need to pursue. So, I mean, for us, for me, I see this play out on a daily basis. I see the need for myself to begin every single day in that attitude and that posture of surrender. I learned this just a few weeks ago about my finances. I have to go to the Lord every single day and I have to say, God, I, I'm, I'm going to trust you with what I need. God, I want to hand over the safety and the security of my family. I want to hand over my future plans. I want, to, I want to hand over the relationships that I maintain, the community that I'm building, the fulfillment that I, that I desire in the depths of my soul. Every single day. That's why Jesus tells us we got to pray for our daily bread, that daily provision. We say, God, I, I want to surrender myself to you today, every day. And then alongside of that, alongside of that posture, that attitude of surrender, I see this play out in, in the way that we participate with the Lord's provision. You see, what's beautiful is that God doesn't just provide miraculously. He does provide miraculously all the time. But it's not the only way he works. It's not the only way he provides. A lot of times he provides through his people. He provides through the body of Christ to support the family whose house burns down, to plant the churches where there are no church, to, 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 to be the love and the grace and the peace, to, to present the gospel to the ears that have never heard it. God works through his people. And so I ask the Lord, God, show me opportunities where I can participate to extend your grace. Open my eyes to see the people who are not obstacles to my goal, of personal satisfaction, of personal security and stability. God, open my eyes to see the people who are opportunities to share your love, to preach your gospel. And I would encourage you to join me in that. To daily go before the Lord and surrender, opening our hands. To daily go before the Lord with that determination on the right track, saying, God, point me in the direction you want me to run. And give me the strength to go for it. So if you would join me in prayer as we ask God to guide our thoughts in those directions right now. Lord, we thank you that you have given us, Lord, this high calling. Lord, this better purpose. Lord, we confess that, that we get distracted. That, Lord, that we, we dedicate our, our hearts and our, our minds to other tasks, to other pursuits. Lord, to things that, that don't necessarily carry the weight that your work does, that don't carry the eternal impact that, Lord, that you're offering us to have. So if you would, take a moment now and ask the Lord to, to send his spirit, ask the Lord to convict you of where you're focused on pursuing your kingdom above his own. It could be with a relationship, with a job, with, a, with an activity, with a, a lifestyle, with a habit, wherever it might be. But ask the Lord, say, God, convict me. Bring to my mind, where am I just running full towards this, this personal kingdom 
that I never stopped and, and even offered up to you, that I never asked you about? Ask Lord to convict you of where are you pursuing your own kingdom over his? And then pray and ask that he would give you a heart of surrender to hold that in open hand, to maybe have a tough conversation with, with a spouse, a, a community member, someone who can maybe help shed some light and some truth on whether or not you're running the right direction. Ask Lord to just bring that to your mind right now. So God, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for this new opportunity, Lord, to be your people, to be your light, your witness to the world around us. Lord, let us help, help us walk faithfully in that endeavor. Lord, we pray these things in your will. Amen. All right, well, we love you guys, and we'll see you in a week.